All right, so we had one last student question for uh, today's breakout session number two, and that is about Whitman's interest in photography. Uh, the student writes, we have heard that Whitman had a strong interest in the photography of his time. Did Whitman ever try his hand at photography? Uh, Whitman absolutely had a very strong interest in photography. I don't know if he ever actually tried taking pictures himself, uh, mainly because the photographic process was very complicated and I'm not sure he would have had the equipment or access to it. Uh, however, he did sit for any number of photographs which you can see <laughs> up on the, the Walt Whitman archive. You can kind of see that Whitman is a you know, it's kind of a, it's a unique situation in the sense that Whitman was one of the uh, first poets able to see, you know, himself age through the photographic process. So you can see uh, Walt Whitman as a very young man in the 1840s, um, dressed as in kind of a dandyish, you know, sort of dapper, you know, how he walked into the newspaper offices as a very young man, you know, wanted a job. He was, you know, had the cane and the, and the suit on. And uh, then you can see the pictures as he ages and gets older, how he's, you know, changing, um, in, in visual images, you can actually see that. He would have been actually able to you know, see that over the course of his lifetime. He was also interested, I'm certain, in uh, photography from the Civil War. I mean, you have photographers like Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner who are actually, um, you know, for the for the first time going out and taking pictures, you know, of the of the Civil War um, hospitals, some of the um, Civil War, the aftermaths so of the battles, the the bodies strewn across the the battlefields. Um, they actually took all of their photographic equipment, so basically they had a, they would have had a dark room on the on the battlefield afterwards and um, basically done the you know, the processing of the of the photographs there and these photographs some of them um, especially the Civil War photographs would have been on display in galleries in New York so Whitman could have you know, if, if he had gone back to York when he was back in New York um, or you know individuals uh, living all around him could have gone to these galleries in New York and they could have actually seen you know these um, photographs of the aftermath of the battles. Um, so that was our last question for the live breakout session number two, uh, and, and this question, I'm, I'm sorry for tech failure, was not taken live, but um, will now be archived. Um, so Stephanie, I was wondering, I know you've done a lot of work with women's uh, fiction. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, the process of uh, reprinting women's fiction, how it started to circulate and how it's circulating now, this, this sort of thing? Absolutely. My most recent project, one that I've been working on for about the past three years, is actually trying to find out uh, how Whitman's uh, fiction circulated. Um, a lot of the a lot of the fiction stories appeared first in the U.S. Uh, magazine and Democratic Review, which was a prestigious literary journal for its time. And so Whitman is, you know, in his his twenties in the early 1940s, and he's um, early 1840s. That would have been a mistake. <laughs> um, not 1940s, 1840s. And he was, um, so he had these stories uh, published in uh, this prestigious literary journal. And um, his first one was Death in the Schoolroom, and that was published in 1841. And that was the most popular story. It was reprinted more than a hundred times. It was reprinted in many states across the nation, and Whitman was aware of some of these reprints. So he knew that wow. it had circulated uh, far and wide. Um, for many years, uh, critics of Whitman's fiction have said that you know Whitman had no talent for writing fiction. His stuff was pretty terrible. Um, and these are words that you will often hear uh, used to describe uh, Whitman's fiction. However, it was really picked up across the country and circulated. Um, the second most often reprinted story that he wrote was a story called A Legend of Life and Love, first published in 1842. And that one had something like 80 reprints um, over Whitman's lifetime. And Whitman's fiction, one of the things that's really most interesting that I learned about as I was doing this project of you know, searching uh, newspaper and magazine databases for these reprints, is that Whitman actually had an, an international circulation. Um, wow. So Whitman's fiction, uh, one of his short stories, A Legend of Life and Love, the one that was reprinted about 80 times, um, that was reprinted in Canada in 1846. Um, another story called uh, The Death of Windfoot, was actually reprinted in Tasmania in 1846. And there were a couple of stories also, um, one in 1842, uh, The Tomb Blossoms, and uh, a couple of others later in Whitman's life that were reprinted in England. So he actually had, you know, at least a few stories circulating internationally pretty early on. 
Um, so I think that's exciting and you know we're just um, because this is fairly new research, we're just sort of learning the scope and the extent of where Whitman's fiction circulated. And this would have been, um, this suggests that, you know, long before people were reading Leaves of Grass, they might have known Whitman as a fiction writer. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, also, I mean, that the people say that Wh Whitman's fiction was terrible, but also his very early poetry was quite terrible as well. Um, but I was, I was curious, you said he may have or may not have known uh, all of the avenues in which his work was reprinted. Um, and I don't know if you can speak to this, but I was wondering about the nature of um, uh, rights and re reproduction rights. Like, who, who would have owned his fiction? How was it sort of proliferating without his knowledge? Um, in the 19th century newspaper cultures, um, editors would see a story that they liked on the front page of a newspaper or a magazine, and they would just take that and put it on the front page of their own <laughs> newspaper. Um, so it's very likely um, that Whitman did not know of all the different places in the country um, that his fiction or even internationally um, might have gone because it kind of had a life of its own. It you yeah. know, went from one newspaper to another um, in this sense. and. Because of that kind of culture of reprinting, Whitman would, it's not likely that Whitman received any more money, no matter right. how many times that story was circulated. Um, but we do know he did write in one of his letters um, to a, a magazine editor. He wrote that he, you know, knew that Death in the Schoolroom had been, you know, circulated across the nation and that he knew it had been pretty popular and extracted liberally, I think is the language that he used. <laughs> um, so he was absolutely right about that. Yeah. Um, even though um, I think in our more contemporary times we have, you know, we don't teach the fiction as much as perhaps the poetry. Maybe we don't read it as much, I don't think, anymore. Um, but seemingly 19th century readers um, in I, they may have enjoyed it, um, they may have liked it. Um, this, the reprinting might suggest that, and it may also just suggest that there was a hole in the newspaper that they needed to fill up um, <laughs> with the columns, and they, they just stuck something in it. So yeah. It's hard to tell which of those might be the reason. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is there a period in Whitman's life in which he was a more active writer of fiction than other periods, or is this simply a period during which his fiction... Um, was dispersed more actively. Whitman was more of an active writer of fiction during the 1840s. Um, so he's writing journalism, but then he's also writing these short fiction stories, getting them uh, published in the Democratic Review, and then a lot of newspapers are picking them up, presumably because the Democratic Review, at, at least at first, uh, they pick them up, presumably because that magazine is a prestigious literary magazine in mm -hmm. the U.S., and they're, they're putting that story on the front page of their paper. And, you know, maybe... Um, and these are kind of speculative conclusions. Um, you know, maybe they, maybe that story was helping them sell copies because a lot of a lot of Whitman's fiction actually appears on the front page more often than any other page um, of the newspaper. It was on the front. Interesting. Um, and for those who you know are in the course and enjoy Song of Myself but have never read Whitman's fiction, um, is there a trajectory you could recommend? If you're starting to read the fiction, and, and I would I would actually start with Whitman's first short story. I would start with Death in the Schoolroom. Um, I think you will see, um, you can see a kind of uh, developing of Whitman's participation in reform movements. This story seems interested in uh, reformation of school systems and educational systems. So I would think starting there, um, Death in the Schoolroom would be a good place to start, and then moving forward, um, I would suggest looking at you know something like The Tomb Blossoms, where Whitman is kind of, he's imagining one of his characters is a, a widow who has lost her husband, and so he kind of imagines what that experience is like. It's as if he's trying to, you know, in the same way that he tries to imagine and see other people, um, you know, in the poem of Song of Myself, trying to see the other. He's imagining mm -hmm. these kinds of characters already um, in his short fiction. Um, something like uh, a short story called The Boy Lover, um, that actually uh, speaks to, um, there's a, th this is about a, a group of uh, young men who actually meet in a bar room and discuss poetry. So you can kind of, you can see the kind of relevance here. It's as if um, somehow what happened at Fafs was already, you know, if Whitman could have known about it, it's like he's describing what happened at Fafs in, yeah. you know, the 1840s already. Um, so that's one of my favorites, actually. So these are, but you can definitely see relations between sort of Whitman, the fiction writer, and Whitman, the poet.
Okay. And are these short stories found on the Whitman Archive, or where, where can we find them? Um, they're not up on the Whitman Archive yet, but there is a collected volume of the early poems and the fiction. Um, Thomas Brasher, um, okay. Brasher's early poems and fiction. Um, they will be available on the Walt Whitman Archive in the future, though. We're working on that right now. Great. Um, well, thanks for everyone who, who tuned in, uh, or those of you who are watching this as an archived broadcast. Um, we hope you will join us for our next video session Monday, uh, which will be released at 8, and that's an asynchronous session, but we also hope that you'll join us for the live breakout session number 3 uh, next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks.